I'd like to offer a very warm welcome to you all tonight uh, to this special Research Tuesday, a forum to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Gallipoli landing. The University of Adelaide, like many organisations and communities, felt the enormous impact of the First World War. There were 512 students, staff and graduates, among them Rhodes Scholars, who served during the war and 71 of these were killed in action. While this number might sound relatively small compared to the huge casualties that were suffered during the, first, uh, during the Great War, the, uni the university was of course much smaller uh, compared with today, so their loss was felt very keenly. Tonight's forum takes place in a building named after two of our Nobel laureates, uh, the Braggs. The younger of the two, William Lawrence Bragg, played an important role during the First World War. He led a team that helped to develop a new technique for sound ranging uh, artillery fire, that is identifying how far away the enemy artillery were located based on the sound given off by their guns. For that, uh, for that work, he was awarded the Military Cross and was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire. Sadly, Lawrence's younger brother, Robert, was, was among those killed in action at Gallipoli in 1915. I wonder what he might have achieved. Tonight, we have with us three of our researchers who will enlighten us with the history and legacies of this important moment in our history. Professor Robin Pryor, Professor Sandy McFarlane, and Alexia Moncrief. We will begin by hearing short presentations from each of our speakers. Robin will uh, talk about the myths of Gallipoli and how they differ from history. Sandy will discuss the enduring lessons of World War I in the field of mental health, and particularly our understanding of the devastating impact of post-traumatic stress disorder. And Ale Alexia will explain why Gallipoli was a critical turning point for the Australian Army Medical Corps. The presentations will be followed by a panel discussion where we will delve a little deeper into their research and perspectives of Gallipoli and then you'll be invited to uh, uh, ask questions. So first let me introduce Professor Robin Pryor. Robin is Professor of History at Flinders University and a visiting professorial fellow at the University of Adelaide. Robin was the inaugural head of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of New South Wales Australian Defence Force Academy, where he taught for 22 years. His particular expertise is in the field of Britain, Australia, and the First and Second World Wars. He's written six books on the First World War, the last entitled Gallipoli, The End of the Myth, and he was also a major contributor to the Oxford Companion to Australian Military History, and to the Cambridge history of the First World War. He has been involved in various projects commemorating the 100th anniversary of the First World War. And he just mentioned to me, I hope it's not uh, private, that he, that he was recently invited to brief the Prime Minister on the history of, uh, of Gallipoli. So please join me in welcoming Robin. Thank you. Uh, there are my visual aids, and that's what it's going to be. Uh, I've got 10 minutes um, to deal with eight months, which is 1.25 minutes per month uh, at Gallipoli. How's that? Can you hear at the back there? If you can't, raise your hand. <laughs> right, they can't hear. Just a second, we'll adjust the sound. The, these seconds are coming off my 10 minutes. <laughs> Try that. How's that? Yeah, good, good, good. Okay, in 8.5 minutes. Um, how was it that Australia and Turkey came to be fighting each other uh, at, uh, on the Gallipoli Peninsula in 1915? The origins of it go back to 1914 uh, when Turkey uh, threw in its hand with the central powers, Germany and uh, Austria-Hungary. Uh, Turkey feared uh, an ally of Britain and France, Russia. They feared Russia much more than they feared uh, Britain and they decided that that was the way to go. They would join with the central powers 
And in November 1914, the Turks thought, looking at the way the war was going, that the Central Powers were winning it. They weren't, uh, and this was a pretty serious mistake. Also throwing in its lot against Britain was another serious mistake for which the Turks would pay dearly and in fact lose the war. However, they didn't lose at Gallipoli. Why Australia? We, were, we had signed up, as it were, to fight the Germans uh, on the Western Front. And in the early months of 1915, we just happened to be training uh, in Egypt. Why were we training in Egypt? Yeah, there wasn't enough room on Salisbury Plain in Britain and the weather uh, was deemed to be too wet and cold uh, for the Australians. They all might catch the flu. This is what uh, actually was said. While they were there, the British decided on a naval operation against the Turks. They were not going to commit troops. They, were, they would commit some of their old battleships against the forts and minefields of the Dardanelles Straits. They would knock those out, proceed to Constantinople, the Turks would surrender, and Turkey would be knocked out of the war. The naval attack started on the 19th of February 1915 and ended in disaster on the 18th of March. Four mines of the 357 were swept, a third of the battleships were sunk uh, by those mines, and the naval attack was broken off. It was felt because of, of British prestige in the East that that couldn't be it, uh, that couldn't be the end of it. Uh, so troops uh, were found uh, for this operation. The idea of the naval attack had been that you didn't take uh, any troops away from the main theatre of war, the Western Front. Troops were now found. The British found a regular division, uh, the 29th, and uh, it just happened that the Anzacs were in Egypt, uh, close to the Dardanelles, and available for operations against Turkey. Once the British had decided uh, to attack Turkey, the uh, French also contributed a division. One feels they contributed a division to watch the British. Um, they fought side by side, uh, again, watching each other carefully. Uh, there were plans already afoot to divide up the Ottoman Empire uh, in the event of a victory. So, Troops were hastily sent out from, from Britain. The Australians and New Zealanders did some rudimentary training in landing from ships. And on the 25th of April, as we all know, the landings took place. The British made the main landing at the south of the peninsula, uh, the very tip of the peninsula around Cape Hellas. They were to push forward towards the Straits um, capture the guns and forts, and then you could sweep the minefields at leisure, the fleet would go through, and everything else would follow. The Australian and New Zealand forces landed further north, uh, just near Garba uh, the idea being that they pushed right across the peninsula, uh, as you can see on the map there, and cut off any Turkish reinforcements being sent against the British to the south. Neither plan worked very well, the British suffered heavy casualties in uh, their landing, uh, much heavier than the Australians, uh, one of the myths of the campaign gone already. Um, the Australians uh, landed at the correct beach, not the wrong beach. Uh, they landed in reasonably good order. Why couldn't they advance inland? Because of the terrain. If any of you have been to Gallipoli, you will know about the uh, difficulty of the country. It's a difficult place to walk around even without a pack and a rifle. Uh, and of course the other factor were the Turkish troops. The Australians struggled uh, on to uh, gain much ground in land and the Turkish uh, troops reinforcements soon sent to the area in the end stopped them. The Turks then tried to counterattack the Australians off the peninsula, which they failed. This was the most costly operation of the campaign. 10,000 Turks were killed uh, on May the 19th, 1915. Um, the carnage was so bad they had to be a truce in order to bury the dead. 
uh, the Australian officers in, out in no man's land made good use of that, troop to, that truce to have a look at the Turkish trenches and see exactly what they were confronting. After the initial failings of the landings in April, stalemate set in. The irony is that this was an operation designed to circumvent trench, the trench warfare that had set in on the Western Front, but this is exactly what set in at Turkey uh, on uh, the Gallipoli Peninsula. This was trench warfare. No one could make much ground. Machine guns and artillery just provided too much opposition uh, for anybody to get anywhere. This stalemate existed right through the summer. In August, there was another big push. Reinforcements had been sent from Britain. The main effort would be made by the Anzac forces in the north, and to their north, another force of British and Irish troops would be landed at Suvla Bay in order to establish a base uh, for northern operations. These operations too failed. Um, the idea was to circumvent the Turkish trenches by going around them to the north. The country to the north of the trenches was even worse than the country facing the Australians. They got lost. Uh, Monash, for example, uh, I think for two days was advancing in the wrong direction, away from the Turkish troops, not towards them. The whole thing uh, fizzled out. The British landed at Suvla Bay and established their base but the Turkish forces were, were undefeated as uh, they had to be, given the terrain. The problem for uh, us with Gallipoli is that however you look at it, whichever way it's looked at, it's not going to go anywhere, even if we'd won. And what would have constituted winning, what would have constituted winning was to clear those minefields knock out the forts and the British to proceed to Constantinople. Even if Constantinople surrendered, and there's no evidence whatsoever that it would have, but even had it done so, what would have followed? Maybe the Turks would have been knocked out of the war. Maybe not. Uh, maybe they would have continued the war from Anatolia. But even if they'd been knocked out of the war, what would have happened then? The idea was that a confederation of Balkan states, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, um, the Greeks, the Montenegrins, the Serbians, would advance up the Danube Valley and attack Germany from behind. There was no chance that these armies, which were little better than peasant levies, could have defeated the Germans, none at all. And to do so, they would have had to cross the Alps, which was an impossibility. Um, given that they only had one railway line available to supply them. What we're saying here really is that this is a campaign, even if it had been won, it wouldn't have shortened the war by a single day. The main army, the great engine of this war, the great engine of the Central Powers, was the German army, and it happened to be on the Eastern and Western Front. As far as Australia were concerned, that army had to be defeated on the Western Front or uh, the war would be lost. Gallipoli uh, was the first of our great uh, military endeavours, but uh, sad to say, it was a futile one uh, which wouldn't have got anywhere anyway. After Gallipoli, we did, our forces did go to the Western Front they played a major role in 1918 in helping defeat the German army, but we remember Gallipoli. Thank you. Thank you, Robin, for that wonderfully brief and uh, concise description of uh, what must have seemed like a lot minute longer than 10 minutes if you were there. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Sandy McFarlane. Sandy is Professor of Psychiatry and the head of the University of Adelaide Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies. He's an international expert in the field of the impact of trauma on veterans, disaster survivors and civilian accidents, having published over 300 articles and being awarded various prestigious awards. He's held the role of Senior Advisor in Psychiatry to the Australian Defence Force and the Department of Veteran Affairs. He holds the rank of Group Captain in the RAAF Specialist Reserve. 
In 2011, he received the Office of the Order of Australia Award in the Australia Day Honours List. The award recognises outstanding contribution to medical research in the field of psychiatry, particularly post-traumatic stress disorders, to veterans' mental health management and as an author. Please join me in welcoming Sandy McFarlane. Well, look, uh, it's a great privilege to be part of this symposium tonight. Uh, and obviously, um, as a psychiatrist, um, I'm interested in this question from the history of, of, of shell shock. Now, can somebody advance the next presentation, please? Yep, it's not... Uh, So obviously as a psychiatrist I'm interested in the question um, of shell shock, but the nature of war cannot be understood without knowledge of the human mind. Uh, and obviously as a psychiatrist I'm interested in history, not only of patients, but of the history of psychiatry. And in considering history we often assume that the risks and execution of battle are understood and that decisions are driven by logical discourse. And what I'd like to do at the beginning is just to address the issue that language is barely able to depict or to describe the nature and the conflagration of war. Equally, those who are naive to the facts of war have little awareness of its reality because it sits so far from the human imagination. The ability to execute a battle to victory and to understand the impact of war on the mind depends upon this knowledge. Understanding the limitations of the human psyche is essential to understanding the prosecution of a military campaign which depends upon the management of fear and the, of, uh, and the knowledge of death. Anzac Cove was where Australia as a nation became aware of this reality. So how well were we prepared for this experience? Now, I'll be referring uh, in a number of my slides to Butler's medical history um, of the AIF in the First World War. And what he commented on, very interestingly, was that the casualty rates were predictable as a consequence of the experience from the Sino-Japanese War, uh, where there were very high rates um, of breakdown in battle in the face of the machine guns and barbed wire. Ironically, um, the medical administration of our armies at Gallipoli were totally unprepared either to estimate the extent of the casualties that occurred at Gallipoli or uh, to be prepared in any way uh, as to how to manage them. Now, one of the fascinating things about this is that clearly they didn't use their imagination or the available knowledge to anticipate the problem. And this is an issue that continued throughout the war and I think it's very interesting in this context to reflect uh, on Siegfried Sassoon's um, protest, which he made uh, and uh, was read out um, in the House of Commons and was also published in the, uh, the Times. Because what he said was that essentially um, uh, the, the battles and the, uh, and the war continued because of the callous complacency with which the majority of those at home regard the continuous of agonies which they do not share and which they have not sufficient imagination to realise. So he's again making this point that um, people, and probably including the generals who hadn't experienced the trenches, had very little reality uh, or sense of reality of what was going on. Now one man who, if they'd only read him, would have pointed this out to be the case. Does anybody recognise who this is? Tolstoy, and he was involved in a battle 60 years previously on, which show, was shown on the, the map there which uh, Robin put up uh, at the siege of Sebastopol. And this is one of the first photographs from a military campaign. It was a photograph of cannonballs in the Valley of Death. Now his, um, uh, one of his first works was in fact the Sebastopol sketches where essentially he was a war correspondent writing for the papers in um, Moscow. And he said, you will see war not as a beautiful, orderly and gleaming formation with music and beaten drums, streaming banners and generals on prancing horses, but war in its authentic expression 
as blood, suffering and death. And I think the introduction to that book probably says what everybody should have understood before the First World War began. The hero of his story, he says, is truth, and truth is not at all lovely and all, not at all reconcilable with military communiques of war correspondence. The truth is that war is not what people think it is and is not as people describe it. Everything is unreal. Nobody knows what is happening or will happen. So when the troops and the medical corps arrived at Gallipoli, I, they, their imagination was totally unprepared for what they had to deal with, uh, I think probably as were the tacticians of the day. So what were the immediate problems in terms of the psychological casualties uh, at Gallipoli? Well, the first thing is that there were large-scale evacuations for a range of conditions. Uh, and I think one of the other things that doesn't get spoken of uh, is that there were short epidemics of self-inflicted uh, wounds by rifle or exposure to enemy fire, in other words, suicide. Uh, when we talk about the uh, heroes of Gallipoli, tragically, uh, there were many uh, who couldn't tolerate what they had to endure in that campaign. And the psychiatric casualties made up uh, something of 2.4% of the total um, hospitalisations from that campaign. Um, and there were a variety of psychophysiological conditions which we don't really um, uh, diagnose in today's parlance, but we certainly recognise traumatic neurasthenia uh, shock and shell shock, which made up um, the, the largest category. Now, how did um, uh, they reflect on this? Well, one of the uh, comments that Butler made was that one of the things that was very different about the Gallipoli campaign was that once you got stuck on that peninsula, you were there to stay. You didn't have any capacity to be rotated out of the trenches, which was certainly something which happened in France uh, and in part uh, uh, was done to try and preserve uh, the psychological um, uh, capacity of the troops. But this was jo just not possible in those circumstances with the obvious consequence. Um, the second thing that was very dis quickly decided in the war was that those who broke down, it was not to do with what they were having to endure. It was to do with the fact that these were vulnerable, inadequate individuals who couldn't face um, the, the baptism of fire in war. So it was a problem uh, that was seen to be one of the seed rather than the soil. It was a way of pejoratively labelling um, the soldiers who became unwell rather than seeing it being a responsibility of command uh, to be managed. So um, how did this campaign then lay the seeds uh, and the journey that went, then followed uh, into the rest of the war? Um, because obviously there was an extraordinary campaign that went for uh, a, a further uh, three years. And I think it's really summed up again by Siegfried Sassoon because what he points out in this um, uh, quote out of um, uh, his book uh, uh, Sassoon's Long Journey, uh, Sherston's Progress, um, is that people thought that it was only people who broke down in battle who were actually subject to psychological injuries. What he uh, correctly characterises in this quotation is in fact many of those people who broke down in fact had functioned at a very high level uh, with great bravery in the face of battle and rather it was the cumulative exposure with the passage of time uh, that led to them uh, not functioning. Uh, and what he also really carves out here, which was one of the legacies that was then fought out by the veterans community when they returned to Australia, was that there was a social contract which the veterans felt had to be honoured by society. He said, in the name of civilization, these soldiers had been martyred and it remained for civilization to prove that their martyrdom wasn't a dirty swindle. And I think in many ways that uh, sentiment still drives the way that uh, the media and the public respond to the whole issue of the psychological casualties of war. And that was something that really began back with the Gallipoli campaign. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That's <coughs> enormously sobering, of course. Uh, finally, I'd like to invite Alexia Moncrief to the floor. Alexia is a PhD candidate from the University School of History. Her thesis, due to be completed this year, examines the medicalisation of the Australian Imperial Force through the work of the Australian Army Medical Corps in the First World War.
The research for this thesis has been partly funded by a grant from the Australian Army History Unit's Research Grant Scheme. Uh, Ale uh, Alexia, please. Simpson and his donkey. The iconic image of Australian medicine at Gallipoli. John Simpson Kirkpatrick is the most widely known member of the Australian Army Medical Corps and together with his donkey, or donkeys depending on which accounts you read, he has become synonymous with the Anzac legend. Each year thousands of school children write essays about them. They are the subjects of countless histories, children's picture books, works of fiction. Their likeness cast in bronze and placed at the entrance to the Australian War Memorial in Canberra and on the banks of the Torrens here in Adelaide. They are the stuff of legend. There is, of course, much more to the story of Australian medicine at Gallipoli than the exploits of this man and his four-legged companion. The arrangements made for the Australian casualties during the Gallipoli campaign were so lacking that they resulted in the restructuring of the AAMC and changes to its position as part of the wider British and Dominion Medical Services. The original medical arrangements for the landings were made by the British General Staff to the active exclusion of the medical services, including those from Britain. These plans, made on the assumption that the landing forces objectives would be met, allowed for a total of 3,000 casualties for the entire peninsula and provided two hospital ships which would, could accommodate up to 700 seriously wounded casualties. On the 18th of April, acting on their own initiative, senior officers of Britain's Royal Army Medical Corps drew up their own plans for the landings. These plans were the first to take into account the possibility of outright defeat, but still did not allow for the chance that the landing force might be able to gain a foothold on the beach without proceeding inland. The casualty estimate was increased to 10,000. These plans were eventually um, approved without alteration by Sir Ian Hamilton, who was in command of the campaign, However, his approval came too late for many of the resources and personnel to be available, and consequently the medical services were not at full capacity for the landings. Not satisfied with the state of the medical arrangements, the Assistant Director of Medical Services for the 1st Australian Division, Colonel Neville House, discussed the state of the arrangements with Generals Bridges and Birdwood as the commanding officers of his division and corps respectively. How suggested to both these men that they had responsibilities beyond those that their rank and position conferred upon them. He argued that as commanders of Australian men, they would be held accountable by the Australian people and government, as well as being accountable to their superiors within the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force. Neither Bridges nor Birdwood had received extra information about the medical arrangements and subsequently supported House as he sought further clarification from the general staff and attempted to make alterations to those arrangements. With these conversations occurring as late as the 20th of April, only days before the landings, it appears as though the official historian of Australian medical services was correct when he mused, and I quote, the medical problems of the Australian force were not the recognised business of anyone in particular. The lack of foresight in the medical arrangements had dire consequences once the plans were put into action and the landings on the Gallipoli Peninsula commenced. If the MEF had been able to meet its objectives and advance inland, there would have been a much better outcome for the casualties. The plans that had been made required significant medical infrastructure on the peninsula and casualties were supposed to be sorted before being loaded onto ships for evacuation to the base. This would have meant that soldiers with minor injuries who would have been well within three to four days of being injured would have stayed uh, near their units. Due to the failure to advance inland, the full complement of medical services was unable to land on the peninsula and the medical arrangements then had to be improvised. The medical services that were able to be established on the beach proved to be insufficient for the task. The first Australian casualty clearing station and its staff were landed a few hours after the first wave of troops and set up on the beach, which required cutting into the cliff to a cliff face to create enough space to erect their tents. As there was no shelter from the cliffs above, the casualty clearing station was visible and susceptible to shrapnel. 
However, the Turkish soldiers did respect the Red Cross markings and did not fire directly on the medical services. The inability to land was not confined to the med medical services. Not all of the troops were able to go ashore as planned, so ships that were already full of soldiers then tried to take on board and provide medical care for casualties. The process of transporting wounded soldiers to hospital ships became haphazard and resulted in many wounded men being loaded onto ill-prepared ships. In one case, soldiers were loaded onto a ship that had been carrying horses for six weeks, with 200 of them still on board, creating significant risk of gas gangrene for those with open wounds, and another ship carrying 700 wounded soldiers was without a single bedpan. There were some attempts to improve the medical arrangements for the August offensive, with a more realistic casualty estimate and some changes in structure and personnel. However, the offensive carried many of the hallmarks of the April landings. The medical services only became aware that there were impending operations when there was a sudden influx of troops at Imbros in July, and corps and divisional medical officers were only informed of the attack the day before it took place, leaving little time for even makeshift medical arrangements. Once again, some personnel did not arrive on the peninsula before the offensive began, and the area in which the casualty clearing station was supposed to be pitched was found to be untenable. The MEF had failed to learn from the problems it encountered in April with the fighting divisions in both April and August, failing to claim sufficient territory to enable the full deployment of medical services. After the conclusion of the campaign, the AAMC was restructured, and as a result of the significant problems with medical arrangements, Neville House agitated for the Medical Corps to become self-governing. He was promoted to Surgeon General and Director of Medical Services for the AIF, and in 1917 he was promoted to Major General. Rather than being reliant on the British Medical Services, Australian base units were created and an evacuation system for Australian soldiers was developed. In contrast to the Dardanelles campaign, where the Australian medical units were controlled by the British directors of medical services of either the MEF, the command in Egypt, or in the UK, depending on where they were located, every AIF medical unit outside of Australia came under the command of the newly knighted Sir Neville House. House's own views were instrumental in the change, and he pushed for an independent AAMC, despite significant opposition from the War Office, the Defence Department, and some members of his own corps. He continued to voice these opinions over the course of the war. In 1917, he gave evidence under oath to the Dardanelles Commission, which was convened by the British government to investigate the campaign. In his evidence, House stated that the medical arrangements for Australian troops in the Gallipoli campaign were so in inadequate that they amounted to criminal negligence. He also argued that Australian, the Australian government should never again trust the medical care of its soldiers to the imperial authorities. He was able to do so with some conviction, given that at the time he gave his evidence in mid-17, the AAMC had been functioning independently for 18 months and had, only a month before, acquitted itself commendably at the Battle of Messines. Having just witnessed the success of the Australian casualty evacuation at Messines, House said to the Commission, if I had an opportunity today of advising my government, I would say that we are entitled to some control over the arrangements that are made for our sick and wounded. The Gallipoli campaign was an early but critical turning point in the development of the Australian Army Medical Corps. The entitlement to control of medical arrangements mentioned by House was born of frustration with the arrangements made by the Imperial authorities, the lack of recourse available to the AAMC when its officers perceived flaws in those arrangements, and the subsequent demonstration by the Corps that it was a competent and capable provider of medical care. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you to our, our three speakers. I'd now like to invite them to come and join me up here, and we'll uh, continue with the discussion. I'd like to begin by asking a general question, which any of you can, uh, can contribute an answer to. Um, 
there, there clearly is a gap between what we call the myth and, and the reality of, of what went on. I mean, as, as someone uh, I read the other was reminded the other day when we won the America's Cup, uh, um, the, the winner claimed that it was the best, it, it was the best victory since Gallipoli. <laughs> Given that we're now 100 years down the track, do you see that we're heading more towards the myth or is the truth likely to, in time, uh, take over? Um, I don't think the myth has got anything to do with what happened at Gallipoli. Um, I, I think people um, commemorate Gallipoli or celebrate it or do what they do independently of the facts. I don't think the facts matter um, at all. I mean, this is a campaign that we lost. We lost decisively. Uh, we sometimes pretend that we won it because we fooled the Turks uh, with the evacuation. The fact is we didn't fool the Turks with the evacuation. They knew we were going and let us go. Why would you do anything else? These chaps are going. Um, you don't come out of your trenches uh, and suffer another 10,000 casualties to see them off. You just let them go. Um, but I think, I, I don't think the, uh, the detail of the campaign, the, the so-called lost opportunities, and every, I don't think that impinges much, uh, myself, um, which begs the question of why we uh, commemorate Gallipoli uh, to the extent we do, and why April the 25th has become our national day which I think in many ways it has. Uh, it's not January the 26th anymore. It's Anzac Day. Um, I don't have a good answer for this. And uh, talking to other groups of historians, they don't have good answers either. It was certainly our first appearance on maybe a world stage. There's a little bit in the Boer War, but mainly uh, at Gallipoli, we appeared on the world stage for the first time as a country. Um, I hasten to add, we didn't become a country at Gallipoli. We were already a country. We'd been a country for 14 years and quite a successful one. Um, but it was our first. We were written up in the British press in glowing terms. Uh, our soldiers were thought uh, to be good exponents of their craft, uh, which, uh, given a decent chance, uh, they were. And. Um, I think it's, it's gone from there. It hasn't been a straight line. Uh, Anzac Day nearly died out in the 1960s and 70s. Um, it was a very contested uh, uh, event. Paint was thrown at soldiers during the Vietnam period and so on. But it revived in the 80s and it's gone from strength to strength. And if anybody's got a good explanation for why that uh, has happened, uh, speak to me after the uh, <laughs> uh, forum. Thank you. Anyone else yeah. like to make a comment? Well, perhaps can I ask Robin a question? Because one of the things that intrigued me, though, was that in the AIF after the campaign, was that the um, people who had been at Gallipoli, the soldiers who had been at Gallipoli, wore a ribbon, either a red or a, a blue ribbon, according to whether they were as part of the original landing party, and wore the brim of their hats down. I mean, did this create a mythology within uh, the AIF in the First World War, which in a sense then was picked up by the community afterwards. Yeah, there was definitely a hierarchy uh, here. When the uh, Australians went to France, um, if, you'd be, if you had been at Gallipoli, you were regarded as special. If you'd come uh, direct from Australia, you were regarded not quite in the same manner. Not quite. The Gallipoli veterans always maintained this claim to primacy within the AIF and the rest of the AIF uh, accepted it. So yes, I think that's a point. Uh, my second general question, uh, again I invite any of you to, to, to comment, is are, are there lessons for us today in, in the truth of what happened at Gallipoli? Don't row yourself ashore on a <laughs> hostile coast at night. Um, <laughs> I got the feeling the uh, present defence force has learnt that lesson. Mm -hmm. um, there are not too many military lessons uh, to be learnt uh, here. Uh, in war, things can go wrong. 
and things always do go wrong. And uh, Gallipoli uh, was probably bad war from the beginning. It wasn't, the, the, the Ottoman Empire was not our primary enemy. Uh, the German Empire was our enemy. The collapse of Turkey did not mean the collapse of Germany. The collapse of Germany certainly meant the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. So um, whether we've learned any of these strategic lessons uh, or not, when we're working with great and powerful friends, I hesitate to say. <laughs> Anyone else like to comment? Um, from a medical perspective, the, um, the lessons, the first one is that planning for things to go wrong is essential because they will go wrong and mm. um, that's what then happened later on uh, in on the Western Front. Uh, they made plans and with contingencies and redundancies built into them and the medical services acquitted themselves um, with much more um, finesse. Um, the other issue for medically was sanitation and hygiene. They're pretty basic concepts but with that many men in a small confined space, uh, sanitation and hygiene become hugely important and those lessons needed to be learnt pretty quickly. Um, and they still are now. They're much better. Robin, you, you mentioned the, 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 uh, the reason that the Turks got involved in the war. Do you think that's something that we should be more interested in, uh, that the role of the Turks and the, 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 um, uh, their strategies and so forth during, during the First World War? Uh, yeah, I do. There's a problem, though. Um, the Turks are not uh, all that forthcoming with documents uh, for, for their own um, uh, part in the war. For six years, I was head of a project to try and get Turkish documents and then translate them uh, into, uh, into English um, so that we could put those documents against the ones we have of our own participation in the war. There are some questions here about the Turkish forces we just don't know uh, and some political questions as well about their involvement on the side of the central powers in the war. Uh, I have to say the Turks were not all that forthcoming. You don't go into an archive in Turkey and help yourself you go in and tell them the general area in which you're interested and they give you what they think you should have. Um, so not uh, in the same spirit as we do research here. We got quite a lot of stuff from them and it's being translated at the moment. Uh, but uh, until uh, they are more open about their material and we have to remember that some of the divisions that fought at Gallipoli played a murky role in the Armenian genocide and this may be why they are so reluctant to hand over this material. I don't know, uh, but certainly the suspicion is there. Um, until that happens, we have to write as best we can and what we have to write is, in a sense, one-sided history. I mean, the Turkish documents aren't going to tell us that we won. <laughs> They aren't going to tell us that we've got it all wrong. Um, but they could tell us, they could help fill in some detail that we just don't know. Um, until they do that, we'll never know it. Uh, Sandy, what were some of the challenges faced by the medical profession in managing psychological casualties during the war? And, and how were they treated when they came back to it? How were the uh, affected soldiers treated when they came back to Australia? Well, I think one of the really interesting things about the First World War was that, in fact, there was some very good thinking about the impacts of war and trauma on people prior to the war. But a, a battle really broke out between the neurologists uh, and the psychiatrists as to whether this was an organic injury, as we all know, uh, related to the concussive effect of shells exploding, in other words, shell shock, which uh, was postulated as being an organic injury as against it being uh, a condition caused by the extraordinary stress and fear and horror of combat. And um, that uh, was a very complicated battle that went on within the profession and in some ways I think obfuscated uh, the development of uh, optimal treatments. Um, and I think the other issue that really got in the way of the development of 
uh, of clear thinking was that um, many people saw this as being a problem of cowardice, mm -hmm. that the people who broke down in battle, it was about moral inferiority. It didn't deal with the idea that there were limits to which the human mind couldn't continue to be exposed and function. I mean, it's one of the interesting things where you keep seeing accounts of men who had acquitted themselves uh, for prolonged periods in extraordinary combat uh, and then would finally break down. Uh, and there was a grudging acceptance that this could happen. But uh, I think that was the e extraordinary les lesson that people were very, very slow to learn. And the way that they, I think, dealt with that within the medical system was to try and actually not diagnose people, to give them um, the recognition of having developed an illness and the idea that you could then get them to very quickly recover and go back to battle. The interesting thing was that the evidence is that they, in fact, very few people were able to go back and function effectively for any long period of time. Um, and uh, in fact there's now some quite good research that the effectiveness of the approach which was called PIES or proximity, immediacy, expectancy and simplicity was probably over conflated by the medical corps really to continue to get resources to do that. You know the real issue was that people had their limits and once they were broken they certainly needed care uh, but in a sense the command really didn't want to know that because it really meant they had to think differently from a tactical perspective. Uh, Alexia, the, you, you mentioned the fact that, uh, that the medical operations came under Australian control after Gallipoli. Um, you, you, I can imagine an argument whereby you'd say Gallipoli was so incredibly unusual that even if it had stayed under um, British control, things would have improved and been different. Is that a reasonable argument or do you think uh, that the, the shift to um, to Australians running the core was, was important? I think there's elements of both involved in that. The, um, the con culture of command on the Western Front was far more consultative than that in Gallipoli, and the medical services were more integrated um, in the Western Front's command than they were at, at Gallipoli, due largely to the fact that um, the those in command at Gallipoli had, um, were very much the old school of um, medical command. They were brought out of retirement, some, some of them, and were not up to date on the um, current doctrines that were used to manage casualties and the um, importance that they had learnt that medical services provided to the um, army out of conflicts such as the South African War. Um, those who were in command on the Western Front were far more uh, aware of the significance of medical care to both the efficiency of the army and um, there was an argument made for morale, though I'm not convinced by that one. So there's certainly an extent to which Gallipoli is an aberration, but it's an important one for the Australian Corps as um, there was political pressure for Australians to gain larger amount of control over Australian soldiers and that um, was not just confined to, us, to the medical corps, that was um, within the army more generally. And so you get elements of both of those issues. Thank you. Uh, this is the moment I hope you've all been waiting for. This is where you get the chance to ask questions of this extraordinary panel that we've got here. Uh, with all the knowledge that they carry around with them. So I, might, I open the floor to questions. We have a couple of roving mi microphones, by the way, uh, so keep your hand up until someone appears with a, a microphone. Um, it's always puzzled me when the Palestine campaign, the Australian light horse, <clears throat> was pretty much in the vanguard of all the... Uh, successful attacks by Allenby's army, um, while Lawrence of Arabia was busy blowing up the Turkish supply lines in the background. And it's always surprised me, and of course we've got the amazing charge at Beersheba, and also the uh, very successful um, Australian contribution to the Western Front. It's always surprised me that Gallipoli even got a look in as our sort of national celebration. 
And I just wonder if you have any comment to make about why the other much more successful contributions to the war that Australia made were not ever really recognised. Um, thank you. I'll have a go. Uh, <laughs> <coughs> um, you're quite right, uh, especially the uh, uh, contributions made by the Australian Corps in France in 1918 were uh, of, uh, they were quite important. We we're only five divisions of 150 in France on the Allied side. Nevertheless, uh, we fought a section of the German army, the main army of the main enemy, and beat them. Uh, yet there is not the awareness uh, of those campaigns that there is about Gallipoli. I think that's changing. Um, the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth has just uh, committed to a large amount of money to build a large uh, interpretive centre on the Western Front, um, which will be opened in 2018, uh, and to some extent with which I'm involved. Uh, that seems to me uh, a straw in the wind that uh, attention is perhaps shifting away uh, from Gallipoli and will after this year in particular to the Western Front. Uh, why Gallipoli though? Um, I think it was the first. I think there's something about the setting uh, of men storming ashore from boats uh, in a pretty remarkable setting. Uh, it's a beautiful place, the Gallipoli Peninsula. Um, and it draws you to it, uh, unlike, say, the beet fields in France, over which we advanced in 1918. They were beet fields then, they are beet fields now. Um, there's nothing particularly remarkable about them. Um, and there is a distinct lack of information there to say that th these were the areas in which major battles took place. But I think the shift is coming. Look, I think it's a very interesting question. I, I mean, I'm not a historian, uh, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist, but I think it's partly... <laughs> but, it's, it's, but it's partly about the nature of memory. I think people uh, remember with much greater vividness the beginning or the early experiences. I mean, to give you a very crude analogy, I think people are much more likely to remember the day they lost their virginity than the 150th time they had sex. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there, there's that element to, to, to it. Um, and I think, and again, I, I'm, I've got to be very careful because I'm not a historian, but one of the things that always intrigues me is the way that Bean really tried to undermine Monash um, so that some of those successes later in the war uh, I think didn't quite gain the attention that they might have because of the relationships between people like um, Keith Murdoch and Bean and the way they tried to, you know, oust... Um, Monash, I'm not sure whether you've got a comment about that. Yeah, they had their own candidate. Um, Murdoch's often do. Um, <laughs> um, nothing's changed there. Um, uh, Keith Murdoch and uh, Bean, who of course wrote the official history, uh, their candidate for the uh, uh, command of the Australian Corps uh, was Brudner White. Um, Brudner White was a brilliant staff officer who helped plan the evacuation at Gallipoli and planned it brilliantly and continued to be a, a brilliant staff officer in France. He was not, however, an operational commander and he knew it. Um, and uh, he certainly didn't push himself forward for the job. Monash was the operational commander. Monash was the engineer as general, the planner, and, and the, uh, uh, neither Bean nor Murdoch could, uh, could see this. And it does show up in some of Bean's history, especially his last volumes of 1918, where we are achieving spectacular successes and they don't quite get the prominence in Bean's history that Anzac does. So, yeah, I think it's a factor. Always watch a Murdoch. <laughs> I've got an unusual question. Um, two of my great uncles were killed in northern France at a little town called Villa Bretonneau. 
They celebrate Anzac Day every year since the town was liberated on Anzac Day 1918. I was there for the 2008 um, service and I plan to be there in, 19, in 2018. Um, I'm just wondering um, what sort of medals would my great uncles have been given um, having served in northern France because um, I'm trying to do some research to try and find out if they got any and where they would get them from. But I'm very proud that they died in northern France and, um, and especially in that little town. Um, and if you go to Amiens, the, the big town north of it, you open your mouth and you're an Australian, they'll do anything for you. Um, you could, uh, if you know the unit uh, in which he served, you could uh, look up the file in the National Archives in Canberra or write to them. Um, it is the relative's uh, prerogative to do that. And uh, looking at his entire file should answer all your questions. Uh, what's, what's interesting about Villas Bretonneau is this is where the new um, museum or interpretive centre is to be built uh, and opened in 2018. Uh, it was a particularly interesting uh, battle that was fought there in uh, 1918. Um, the Germans had just captured uh, the, uh, the village and threatened the uh, rail junction at Amiens about 15 miles away and uh, the Australians uh, carried out a night counter-attack which was quite unusual and captured it, uh, took it back and uh, yeah that's uh, the school uh, has a sign, there are signs in the streets, we do not forget Australia. Um, several towns in northern France have those signs. Peron, where, where there's also an excellent museum, has uh, a great banner across its main street, we do not forget Australia. And they have a street called the Rue de Kanga. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll just, uh, if I may, um, return to two of the earlier questioners. Already two people have used the word celebration, referring to Anzac Day. Now, that does worry me, um, to be quite frank, and I hope I haven't given offence here. But in, I believe in 1916, Brian, did it start then in Melbourne or Sydney? The first march through a city? Sorry. Uh, Robin, sorry, Robin. Um, Could be Brisbane, be actually. Oh, <laughs> Brisbane. Because I believe the marchers didn't actually march. They wore black. There were no bands, no sort of triumphant processions through those cities or that city. It was quite the opposite of a celebration. And it worries me immensely that the governments, Labor and Liberal, I think, have, as you said earlier, made Anzac Day a national day. Could you, would you get a comment on that observation, please? Yeah, there are so many towns and cities that uh, put forward the fact that they had the first Anzac Day <laughs> that uh, it's now almost impossible. Uh, Brisbane has as good a claim as any, uh, actually. Um, I wouldn't use the word celebration. Uh, I'd use commemoration. Uh, I think that's a better word uh, to use. Um, I have to say, though, I, I'm, I don't think it's governments that have made Anzac Day a de facto national day. I think it's the people. Um, I think governments have jumped on a bandwagon that was already rolling. It started to roll sometime around the mid-1980s. What caused it is a matter of some controversy. Was it Peter Weir's film, Gallipoli, 1981? Was it the passing of the old diggers who died in the late 80s and early 90s? By the time um, Paul Keating makes his oration over the unknown soldier, the bandwagon is well and truly moving. And Paul Keating didn't particularly want to carry out that function. He, he was very uneasy about it. And uh, I, I think you know, governments can see public opinion move and they certainly don't want to be too far behind it. And my feeling is governments have been running to catch up to public opinion for some time. I think they've now made it, by the way. Um, uh, uh, but I, I think Anzac Day really is a creation of the people. Um, the crowds at the dawn service that you didn't see in the 1960s and 70s, 
They're not government driven. Uh, people have decided they want to go, as is their right. These are the things we fought for after all. And we've made up our own minds, I think, for better or worse, that this is our national day. And uh, uh, that's it. Uh, look, I think it's a, that's a very interesting question. I, um, uh, uh, after the first Gulf War, had to write a report for the United Nations Compensation Commission uh, about the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait. And I then uh, was an advisor to the government in Kuwait. Um, and it was a very complex issue about remembrance. And I think remembrance is another word that we need to really think about here because the issue is that people who come back from war often bring terrible memories, but also good memories of what's happened. So there's actually a living collective experience that um, I think sometimes needs a focal point. And that's not something which governments control. And the Kuwait government was actually very troubled because um, the first group who really rose up against the Iraqis were women who at that stage in the Middle East were actually wearing jeans and T-shirts who started wearing in the traditional dress and then were smuggling weapons under their um, abayas. Uh, and that really presented a major problem about how, who, who were the heroes uh, and how, how should they remember them. Um, and I think the other thing about the, uh, the First World War um, is the, the terrible grief um, uh, that was experienced by this nation. Um, you know, the, every time you look at a, 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 an official record you get a different number, but you know, there were at least 60,000 people killed. And you know, I often point out to people that you know, the population was around 4.5 million again, depending on who you speak to. Now, we had more people die in the First World War than Americans were killed in the Vietnam War. Now, that's something that doesn't happen um, without there being enduring consequences uh, within a community. Um, and the way that that memory lives within the lives of the people who were directly exposed to it will shift once the generation who directly felt that cost died. Um, and I think that's why, you know, this, the, the, the way that we identify with these experiences really is an amorphous living experience and it's often the way that those experiences have been impregnated into families and into generations and people uh, where people get a sense from where they've come in a sense it's it's a respect uh, for, the, for our, the, the, pr the prior generations that I think is often shown in a day like Anzac Day. My question is for Professor McFarlane. Um, could you please speak a little bit more on shell shock? Sometimes people have a notion of it being that the man was either totally broken down or not. And we've sometimes seen tapes of uh, people uh, twitching in a St. Vita's dance-like way. Um, so could you comment on whether there's a, an in-between stage where, for example, the lingering effects on veterans last a long time and it's not just all about what happens at the battlefront or during the war. Thank you. Well, Can there, you just repeat the Yes, question? look, the, the question is really to talk about what is the nature of the symptoms and the presentation of shell shock. And I think one of the um, historical um, references is that the, we often see these photo photographs and movies of people who had conversion disorders where they were shaking uncontrollably or experienced paralysis. Um, now, I think one of the, 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 uh, the first really very interesting issues is that those conversion disorders are relatively uncommon, well, really very uncommon in, in modern psychiatry, and people think, well, this, was this some sort of culture bound syndrome? One of the um, uh, very interesting observations was made that those syndromes decreased dramatically in their preval pre uh, prevalence once the front became fluid. And in fact, those. Um, uh, motoric and uh, uh, somatocentric that where people, for example, became mute, was about the physical expressions of fear that became expressed in, in the motor and the sensory systems of people. Now, one of the great lessons, which was, you know, I think psychiatry has been very slow to learn, is that in fact many people function very effectively in the face of battle, and it's only with the passage of time that their memories of the horrors of what they've been through come to haunt them. And that's because uh, 
uh, these fears and these memories can be suppressed by, by certain neural systems, but it's a bit like driving your, brake, your car with one foot on the brake and one foot on the accelerator. Uh, uh, eventually, the brakes wear out, in contrast if you were just driving your car with a foot on the accelerator. So that age is an important contributor. And the other thing is that these, in these, this, we now recognise that these disorders involve neural systems that, uh, and, and stress systems that underpin a multitude of other uh, disorders. I mean, in fact, there was a very interesting battle amongst the veterans community after the First World War to have a phenomenon called the burnt out soldier effect recognised by the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, and this was, the, there was this belief in the veterans community that people were dying prematurely or prematurely developing chronic diseases. Uh, and in fact, they did a study uh, which showed that, in fact, if you'd fought on the Western Front, you, your life expectancy was decreased by five years on average. Um, so uh, we do now understand that, you know, that there is a very long tail of effect of these sorts of exposures, and we are now doing research of our currently deployed personnel where we're actually measuring many of these biological systems, trying to identify the populations at risk so we can develop uh, ways of preventing these syndromes emerging in older age. Oh, okay. Um, in Reynolds and Lake, in their book, uh, What's Wrong with Anzac? The Militarisation of, Austra of Australian History, essentially call for a demythologization of uh, the Anzac tradition and the sort of future proofing of it against jingoism and militarism. Is doing this just a matter of coming to terms with a, a deeper realisation of the real human cost of war or is there more to it than that? Yeah, I've, I've, I've read that book um, and to some extent I'm, I'm I'm critical uh, of it. Um, they think that uh, Anzac is, uh, and military matters are taking over Australian history. Uh, I don't think that's the case. Uh, I don't know of anyone who's prevented from writing any other kind of history uh, in this country uh, right now. Um, I don't know that uh, their, their worries that this is militarising Australian society are well founded either. I don't see that. Um, we, we, we're now in, into the second year of, of a four year commemoration, whatever you like to call it, of the First World War. I don't see Australians being militarised in any sense at all. Um, I think maybe they're being familiarised with the, the horrors of, of war with the cost of war, um, but with also a realisation that sometimes wars have to be fought. We have to be very careful on those occasions where we fight a war because uh, they are such terrible things, the worst actions human beings uh, can engage in in, some, in many ways. So we have to be awfully careful to pick our moment and perhaps we haven't been good in the last 20 or 30 years at picking that moment. Uh, but this is not to say that occasionally wars don't have to be fought. Um, their, their view is that we've always fought other people's wars. Uh, I, I reject that in, in terms of the First and Second World War. I mean, everybody's got a different opinion on this. But mine is that, that both of those had to be fought, that they were fought really in the defence of liberal democracy of which we were one of a very small number. I count 12 democracies in 1914, 12. Um, I don't know how many there are now, but more than that. Uh, even in 1939, there weren't all that many, 20 or so. Um, and I think we fought both of those wars in the defence of that, liberal democracy. So I'm not really uh, agreeing with them uh, while I think maybe there's far too much written on uh, Anzac. Um, I mean, everybody can say that and then point to the exception of their own book. Uh, um, I would do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a, a question and a, 
you mentioned earlier about the, some of the soldiers, the Australians went from, uh, from Gallipoli over, over to the Western Front and then there's a significant number, particularly the Light Horse, went to Egypt and into the Sinai campaign. And <coughs> that's one occasion where Australia had a victory and <coughs> there's, <coughs> excuse me, and the Turks surrendered there on that uh, Sinai campaign. <coughs> <coughs> my, my father survived the Gallipoli and he was one of those that went with the third light horse to Egypt and then took part in that, pushing the Turks out and uh, they eventually, eventually surrendered there. So we never, <coughs> oh God, we never hear much about that in, in our history and this is one occasion where Australians did have a victory. Uh, we don't. There's a very good book by Alec Hill on the, on the light horse um, that's still around, I think. Um, there's also a, a recent book by Geoffrey Gray called The War Against the Ottoman Empire, which gives that particular campaign its due, uh, as have I in a chapter I wrote for the Cambridge uh, History of the First World War. So there is a bit of stuff, but I agree with you, there's not the amount that you'd, uh, you'd expect, uh, especially with a victory. And it's one of the peculiar things of Gallipoli that Australia, uh, if it likes anything, likes to win. Uh, and yet here we are um, with a hall full of people um, talking about a defeat. Um, it's uh, a peculiar thing indeed. But I, think, I think we'll be hearing more about the light horse, uh, especially in 2017. Uh, the hundredth of their great victories in the Sinai uh, and the desert. So question down here and... Hi, I'm, I'm Pauline Payne from the History Department at Adelaide University. I've got a question for the audience and a question from one of the panellists. And the question for the audience is, relates to um, a research project, a, a group of us uh, have a, a workshop organised for History Month where we're looking at what happened to uh, South Australians of German heritage in World War I. Uh, if you, any of you uh, could approach me afterwards if you know of such people, particularly in my case for the program, if they came from a business and professional background. Um, the question from the panellists relates to um, how, what soldiers were told uh, after, to, to do after the war. Um, I, I reckon um, my, my father, who was a, a, in fact an engineering student from the university who enlisted, was I think one of many people who just didn't talk about their experiences. My understanding, Sandy, is that many doctors told them not to talk about it. And, and probably this was so after World War II that it was thought it was better if they didn't talk about it. Would, would you like to comment on that? Oh, yes. Look, I think there was uh, very much the, the message w was that you should try and return to your normal life. I mean, in a, in a sense, there's, there's not such a, a naivety about that. I mean, uh, I think the other difficulty, and, and, and I think veterans will tell you about this, as will people have been through other sorts of horrific traumas, is there's nothing worse than trying to tell somebody and people have no sense of what you're saying. And I think you know, it's one of the tragedies and the difficulties is that I think much of what happens in, in the heat of battle and in the horrors of war is that people see and experience things which people's imaginations just who haven't been there are not prepared to hear and cannot understand. And if you're looking to somebody for understanding and empathy and you get dealt with in a dismissive manner, uh, there's nothing that's more disenfranchising. So that in a sense, I think that silence is often built by the fact that uh, you know, these experiences are not well expressed in language and the lack of the imagination of the listener. Um, I mean, you know, we've also got that problem when the Second World War veterans returned, the RSL didn't really want them to become veterans or members of the organisation because they hadn't fought a real war. When the Vietnam veterans came back, the RSL veterans from the Second World War didn't want them 
either because they hadn't fought in a real war. I mean, it's amazing. You would think the generations who might have been empathic weren't. So that I think, you know, this is a very much a, a very complex issue about the, you know, the capacity to speak and to be heard. I'll take two more questions. I know there are lots of hands up, but uh, thank you. Um, Winston Churchill was the um, head of the British Navy in 1915, and he took the blame for the failure of the Gallipoli landings. Was this justified, or were there other people who should have taken the blame? Yeah, uh, I, I always think you should blame the Prime Minister for almost everything. Um, <laughs> It's odd that the Prime Minister at the time, uh, Asquith, has escaped a blame, yet he presided over the British War Council, which decided uh, on uh, the first the Dardanelles campaign and then the Gallipoli campaign. Not a troop, not a ship could have been uh, deployed had not the Prime Minister and the other members of the War Cabinet uh, uh, agreed. Uh, Churchill uh, got the blame. Um, Churchill, I don't think, is the warmonger of, uh, of, of popular legend. Um, when he was in a war, though, he was very enthusiastic about um, his part in waging it. And I think that's the problem with uh, Churchill in, in 1915. But to say something for Churchill, he was one of the few members of the cabinet who'd actually travelled to the Western Front and seen the result of a failed attack there. He'd seen men hanging on barbed wire. He'd seen bodies blasted to smithereens. What he was trying to do uh, at Gallipoli, especially with a naval attack, was to avoid that. The fallacy was you couldn't avoid that. Um, but I don't think we should condemn him too much for trying. One more question. I, I was uh, quite moved in many ways when you said that the uh, enemy didn't fire on the tents that, we, that were set up for medical evacuation and medical treatment. Um, how do you feel now when you may be facing an enemy which is wholly unlike the ones that we've been talking about and who we're going to describe as barbarians. Do you think they will recognise the Red Cross uh, symbols on the tents? I don't know. Um, that's, that's one of the concerns of, of war. Um, and there was, there's certainly an, ex, um, an element of surprise that is expressed in the diaries of um, medical officers when the Turkish soldiers do not fire on um, the Red Cross marked um, units uh, because the Australian soldiers have been told to expect um, an uncivilised opponent. And so... That, that surprise is expressed in numerous diaries. And they do fire on a pier that is marked with a Red Cross flag, but that is only after the Australian um, forces have used that pier um, to bring ashore weaponry while the Red Cross flags were still up. Um, they also fired on it when no one was near the pier, so no one was injured. Um, so. The Turkish army certainly acquits themselves well in terms of the Geneva Convention um, at, at Gallipoli. Can I just add something to that? The wars we're fighting now are different. Uh, they've been called Wars Among the People. Uh, by, uh, and there's a good book on, 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 on them by uh, a British general called Rupert Smith. Um, it's a new face of warfare. We fight them in urban areas we fight the wars surrounded by the people. In these circumstances, it's very, very difficult to separate ha who is a, a civilian from who is a combatant, and it's very difficult to, um, uh, uh, to abide by the, con the Geneva Conventions and the Hague Conventions. Uh, when you're on uh, an area like the Western Front, um, or even at Gallipoli, it's much easier. Uh, now 
maybe some of us haven't got more barbaric, it's just got more difficult. Uh, and there's a, maybe an, uh, a good uh, dictum to say that if you can't tell the civilians from the, the combatants, you're in the wrong war. Well, on that very worrying and sad note, um, I would like to thank our three speakers for uh, giving us a, a, a wonderful view of what happened 100 years ago and a lot of what's been happening since. And this is a small token, you'll never guess what it is, um, uh, but very appropriate for, for this state uh, of our gratitude. So would you please uh, join me in thanking our speakers.